Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> stage we are merely players we have our entrances and we have our exits scribes and pharisees kings and queens rich man poor man jew and gentile slave and free men and women all will have to bow before the lamb Is on, so will be the judgment. I will give an account to the Lord of history. Liars and deceivers, hypocrites and self righteous, murderers, idolaters, moral and moral, the bitter and the jealous, the cowards and the brave. Ebenezer bow before the Lamb. Cause every knee shall bow And every tongue confess That Jesus Christ is Lord Jesus Christ is Lord Are you ready now for the judgment? Is he your savior or is he your judge? Final act has come, Christ will come to rule this world. Satan will be crushed, and all those who follow. Rebels devising evil, conspirators them all. Arrogant, independent, spies on the one who made them all. Rulers and authorities, your end has come. Cause every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Jesus Christ is Lord Jesus Christ is Lord Okay, I'm going to play one more for you. I wasn't going to, but I decided to. <laughs> All right. Where are you, father, mother, sister, brother? Where are you, rich man, poor man, black and white? When you get to the grave, then it will be too late, for you won't have a prayer. No, you won't have a prayer in the end. Oh, where are you, kings and queens and presidents? Where are you, doctor, lawyer, man of morals? If you stand on your own, stumble and fall for you won't stand a chance no you won't stand a chance in the end oh yeah
If you stand on your own You will stumble and fall For you won't stand a chance No, you won't stand a chance In the end Oh, where are you? Artist, poet, comic musician Alone and dying Do you think it's a game? Well, there's a knock at your door Will you dare to believe? Will you dare to believe in the truth? Who is Jesus? Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved and be saved and be saved. Okay, I'll be right back. Gonna put away the guitar. I'll be right back with you. All righty. Uh, good morning again. Could you, could you turn your Bibles to the epistle of Jude, Jude verse 1? Only one chapter, as we've been pointing out, in that epistle just before Revelation. So Jude verse 1. And we're going to be wrapping up our study today of Jude 6 by noting the implications of the judgment of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, 2, and 4, as we've been pointing out um, that uh, the, the, the contents of Jude 6 are actually interpreting for us um, the actions of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, 2, and 4. And we pointed out to interpret Jude 6 properly, we must compare um, the contents of Jude 6 along with uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, and of course, Genesis 6, 2, uh, 6 chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. So uh, Jude 6 is actually describing the uh, actions, interpreting the actions of the sons of God, the Banaha Elohim, who were fallen angels, as we pointed out, who uh, it, um, possessed the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex with unregenerate women, and the offspring were the Nephilim, who were human beings, not half men, half angels, as we pointed out. The angels don't have the ability to procreate, and so it was a demon possession is what it was, and that's what it meant by taking wives for themselves. So uh, they were doing it through these un unregenerate men. So uh, we'll be wrapping up our study of Jude 6, noting the implications, which is very important, of this particular um, uh, verse, the contents of this verse, as well as the uh, lead to our application, which I've been bringing out from time to time already, but uh, a very important application for the Christian community in America and around the world. And uh, it's a very important uh, uh, study here today. And just, uh, just a reminder um, that uh, our Sunday class uh, this Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the scheduled class has been bumped up to tomorrow. Uh, we'll be teaching uh, Sunday's class instead on Friday tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time because I've been invited to go uh, down to, back down to uh, Doctrinal Bible Church in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, Pastor Buddy Peaks Church. And uh, so they've invited me back down there again, and I'll be down there for the weekend. I'll be leaving Sunday, uh, Saturday morning and uh, leaving there uh, on the 23rd. So I fly in on Saturday the 21st, teach on the 22nd, and fly back on later in the day on uh, the uh, Monday the 23rd. So uh, mark that in your calendar. And uh, it's been busy. Last couple of months have been really busy. I've been asked to uh, speak twice, past my guy I got ordained with, Jim Ricard, his ministry twice, I've been asked to uh, teach over there, and also uh, Pastor Dave uh, Stewart, uh, the pastor of Dighton Community Church in Dighton, Massachusetts, invited me a few weeks ago to, to uh, speak at his place, so it's always 
uh, great honor, and uh, it's very um, uh, humbling that these these people actually would like to have me speak in their church and, and stand behind in their stand in their pulpit. So it's a great honor that when people ask you to do that, and uh, so. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's the the, uh, the only uh, really announcement I have right now, and uh, could you please also keep that in prayer that trip down there, and as I've been reiterating to people who have actually been co uh, contacting me that follow Winston Bible Ministries and support this ministry, I've been saying to them through these broadcasts and uh, and also uh, in private correspondence with people, uh, if I if they do select me to be their pastor and uh, um, down there. Um, it's uh, it's not gonna, Western Bible Ministries is still going to continue, so don't, don't don't think it won't continue. Uh, it uh, um, though I'll be um, the the private this you know I don't even know uh, right now. It looks like we'll be teaching at, at Doctrinal Bible Church on Sunday. Of course, there's two sessions, uh, su uh, Sunday morning and then uh, on Wednesday evenings. And so uh, the Western Bible classes, Western Bible Ministries, I can be really flexible. In fact, since I've come back here to Massachusetts in 2019, if you notice, the schedule has changed from uh, time to time, and that's because I was taking care of my father and mother. My mother has dementia, and she went into a nursing home last year, and she's been there almost a year now. So my dad, I think, has adjusted pretty well. So I, I don't really have uh, any trepidations about um, you know leaving Massachusetts and leaving them to go down to Huntsville. So if they offer me the job, so. Um, you know, the, uh, so therefore, you know, Tuesday and Thursday class will probably stay the same at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Sunday class that we have here at Winston Bible Ministries would probably be bumped up maybe to on a Saturday morning at 11 a.m. or maybe I can make it any time I want, um, uh, which is great about it. And then, or I can make it late, later in the day Sunday. It depends on, you know, um, you know, so I'm, just, I'm you know, so people were were a good friend of mine, and she's, another people have had. So it basically, be another a second job is what it is. Um, but uh, um, you know, far as the uh, studies, I mean, what I teach here at Winston Bible Institute, I could I could teach over it in Huntsville. In fact, a lot of the stuff I've done in the past, I could probably teach down in Huntsville because they've never heard me teach these books. That you know, for those who followed me for twenty years, over twenty years now. So uh, I don't see any uh, you know people who you know oh it's a high maybe a, a, a two, you know it's a, it's a valid you know. Concern, people worried. You know, you know, you're not going to get you know, burnt out. It's like, well, <laughs> I used to teach four times a week for years in Iowa. People forget, and I had I did two studies: one for the the, the weekday crowd, and then one a study for the the uh, Sunday crowd. So that was a lot of work. Preparing the lessons is a lot of work. Teaching is really not, it's, it's a piece of cake. But um, um, the far as the uh, preparing, so, but now I've I've gone down to one study starting last year, so I make it one study. So whatever I teach here at Winston Bible Ministries, I'll be teaching over there, in Huntsville. Um, so you know, so don't worry about it. If you have any questions, e email me, give me a call. You got my phone numbers on the website at Winston.org. So uh, no need to worry about it. And uh, so um, um, glad that you uh, are joining us. And I did a great class today planned for you. So. Uh, we had a great week of classes, so let's uh, let's have a great class today, wrapping up our weeks, uh, weeks this week's studies. And again, remember, we, we, we Sunday's class is bumped up till to, to, tomorrow uh, because I'm uh, I won't be here this weekend again, as I said before. So let's take a moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit could cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But, and that was my cord that just dropped on the ground, I apologize that. Uh, and uh, so it, when we take this moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly could commit, knowingly commit would uh, cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so through, through 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. Now, we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit in Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. And if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your word. We thank you for all those who are joining us live or through the recordings at a later date. Thank you for each and every one of them that are your children and those who might not yet be your children. We thank you for them as well. We thank you for the technology and the people taking advantage of it. We we just thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to this ministry. Thank you for your faithfulness to my ministry and uh, the people you've raised up throughout the years up to the present moment that have been uh, good stewards of the time, talent, and treasure and truth that you gave them and that they've been supporting this ministry with their prayers, attending classes, serving in the ministry in some capacity or and helping us financially. I just thank you for each and every one of them. And uh, I just pray uh, that you would... Uh, continue to uh, use this ministry mightily. Thank you for the various uh, podcasts and websites, media platforms that you've given to us. And uh, we're all around the world and China and everywhere. I was just amazing, Father, what uh, you've been doing with this tiny little ministry. And I just thank you for that. And I pray you would uh, use these things that we're putting out there, protect them from the evil one, use them mightily. I also pray, Father, that you would thank you for the people that you've raised up that have been helping us out financially over the years. I pray you continue to raise up more people to help us out and to get the Word of God out. And uh, I just thank you, Father, for the study in the epistle of Jude. I pray it would be a blessing, a great blessing of the body of Christ and bring glory to you now and in the future. And uh, Father, today, I pray that you would help me to communicate your Word with the accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power so I can minister to your people in any unsaved, providing them their necessary spiritual nourishment to grow to spiritual maturity. I pray that you would help your people in the audience to learn, understand, and enjoy and apply accurately what they're being taught. Please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. And, uh, and I just pray, Father, this lesson would help your children to grow to spiritual maturity, become more like your son, Jesus Christ, in thought, word, and action. I also pray for the, the, the non-Christian community that is, uh, might be watching. I thank you for them, and I pray that they might at some point hear the gospel by the power of the Spirit, help them to understand the gospel so that they can make a decision to either accept or reject your son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. I also pray for the uh, technology again, and I just thank you for it. I pray that you would uh, the streaming video by YouTube. We thank you for that service they provide for the live broadcast, and I pray it would function properly. And thank you for all the other times it has. And uh, I just pray, Father, there be no problems with the recordings, the video and the audio, and upload these things to our various websites and podcasts and media platforms that you've given to us. Use them mightily, Father, please, and protect them from the evil one. So, Father, we pray for this service in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. If you haven't turned there already, please do. Go to uh, the Epistle of Jude and go to Jude verse 1. Uh, we'll be reading uh, in, in a little bit from the, um, the ESV, uh, the first six verses of Jude, and then I'll be reading from my translation of the, uh, those six verses. And then we'll be looking at today, our final hour of study on the, the Epistle of Jude, We'll be noting today, as I pointed out earlier, the implications of the judgment of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, 2, and 4. Now, as we pointed out in previous classes, uh, Jude 6 is the second example, presents the second example uh, from the Old Testament of the Lord judging those who rebelled against him. And then in the second hour of our study of Jude 6, we noted that Jude 6 in, is uh, used in relation to the sons of God in Genesis 6, 2, and 4. And then we answer the question in our third hour of our study of Jude 6, did the sons of God in Genesis 6, 2, and 4 receive the ability to procreate? And then we, uh, the first uh, half of Jude 6, we noted that uh, this verse, the first two uh, declarative statements in the verse, actually interpret the actions of the sons of God in Genesis 6, 2, and 4. And then the rest of the verse, the last half of the verse, presents the judgment of the sons of God in Jude 6, 2, and 4. And then, lastly, today we'll be noting the implications of the judgment of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, 2, and 4, the Banaha Elohim, the sons of God. So we, as you can see, uh, I could have gone through this verse in one hour, and, uh, and many have, and there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, to, in my, as far as my um, conscience is concerned, and those who know me, I, am, I, I, I feel that this verse has got a lot in there and there's a lot of content in there and a lot of explanation, especially this verse because it's very controversial, very difficult to interpret. So I took my time in the verse. There's a lot to be said. So if we're going to, I had to identify for you uh, who Jude's talking about with these angels that left their, their uh, proper uh, domain. And uh, so we had to identify who these angels are. So we went through the whole thing with Genesis 6, 2, 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, 1 uh, uh, Peter 3, 18 through 20. And so th that's very important. So we, I took my time going through this. Now I could have zipped through it, but 
again, you have to, as a, I tell guys all the, all the time, you know, I, not everybody's like me and there's guys like me <laughs> that trust me, there are. Uh, but, um, but I, you know, the way I was, you know, the way I am and the way I'm taught, anybody who knows me, I, I'm either all in or I'm, I, I'm either putting everything into it or I'm not, I don't want to do it. If I, if I, if, so when I do this, I put everything I can into it. So I don't want to leave any un, stone unturned. I like to do a thorough job and, Honestly, it's because I'm conscientious about what I do. I don't, I'm not, and, and not, not saying that if you, you know, because the guy who turned me on to the Bible is J. Vernon McGee. You know, he's, uh, and he went, that was for, you know, for new, you know, not for new believers always, but he would say, you know, he, he would simplify it. He would go through the Bible in five years and everything. You could do that. And I'd love to do that myself. But, um, so that was what God led him to do. I've, I've always know this, have this conviction that God's been leading me to do exactly what I'm doing. And I'm finding out that a lot of people want this kind of detail that are not getting it in their churches, and uh, and so therefore, I, you know, they ha- they can go to me. And there's other guys who, who are very thorough, like Pastor Jim Ricard, down the road from me uh, that I go to Dane with. So I do this. You know, I could I I, I I took this verse in six hours because of the difficulty of the verse. And anybody who studies this verse, a, a, a scholar, a biblical scholar, or a pastor, they know how difficult it is. This book, enti- entire book. So. We take our time and I try to take my time and explain things and build upon things so that we get a proper idea of this particular verse and and, and we'll make the application. So, because we can't make an application how it applies to us in our day and age if we don't know what it means to the original audience. So, uh, this is very important. We understand these things. So, uh, because this is my, where God's leading me, this is the way I do it. And I don't, and I, you know, I was taught by my past that, you know, don't rush, you know. And, you know, that's when you make mistakes. And so I, I don't like to rush. In fact, all my, you know, it's interesting. I've said this before. All my lessons that I teach now, they were finished three, four months ago. And so, but I'm not, as I'm leading up to teach these verses, I'm looking over my notes. I'm looking over the, I'm way ahead in the book or I've, you know, I've already finished the book before I teach it to you. You know, it depends on how the size of the book. So um, by the time I go to teach this, I know this, I know this pretty well. So I, and I've, I've done a thorough job as best as I can, best of my ability that God has given me. So, so with the, the, obviously with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm, I pray that this study will be a great, along with the rest of the things we've done over the years, will be a great blessing to the body of Christ and the non-Christian community as well. So today, again, we'll be looking at the, the implications. We'll wrap up our study of Jude 6 by knowing the implications of the, uh, of the judgment of the fallen angels in, uh, in Genesis 6, 2, and 4. This will constitute our 25th hour in this epistle. So look at we're going to read from the ESV today, the first six verses. Look at Jude 1. Jude 1. Jude verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. There's the greeting to the letter. Verse 3 begins the body of the letter, which ends in verse 23. Beloved, verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in on notice who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, if you could look at my translation of these exact same verses on the board, from Jude, a slave owned by Jesus Christ, as well as James' brother, to those who exist in the state of being loved by God, who is your father. Therefore, to those who are the effectually called ones, who are existing in the state of being kept, in the state of being protected, by and for the benefit of Jesus Christ, may divine compassion be increasingly experienced by each one of you, so as to increasingly experience divine peace, as well as to increasingly experience divine love. Beloved, verse 3, although I have prepared myself with utter diligence to communicate in writing for the benefit of each of you, regarding our common salvation, I have entered into the state of experiencing compulsion to communicate in writing for the purpose of exhorting and encouraging each and every one of you at this particular time to make it your habit of exerting intense effort 
for your own benefit on behalf of the faith, which has been delivered once and never again for the benefit of the saints. For certain people have joined all of you surreptitiously with evil intent, specifically those who long ago are written about beforehand with regards to the same type of judgment I'm about to describe, who are ungodly, who are exchanging experiencing the grace of our God for practicing criminal behavior. Consequently, they're refusing to follow the one and only master, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, now I am prompted, I am prompted to desire to cause each and every one of you to be reminded, even though each of you were possessing a thorough knowledge about each of these examples, that Jesus, sometime after having delivered the people from the land that is Egypt, the Exodus generation, destroyed those who did, would not believe, the, uh, the, those who died in apostasy, that died the sin to death as believers. Verse 6, correspondingly, he is keeping by means of eternal chains under the control of total supernatural darkness for the purpose of executing the judgment during the great day of those who entered in the state of not keeping their own sphere of activity, but rather, in fact, abandoned their own place of habitation. So, um, as I pointed out in the past before about my translation, it's more of an it's more interpretive. All translations are interpretive. Any translator will tell you that. And, uh, and all of our modern translations are excellent. No cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith is lost in any of these translations, contrary to some people who are ignorant, quite frankly, of how we get our Bible, our English, our, our, and how the and what textual criticism and the dot and the manuscripts. All these translations today, modern translations, are absolutely phenomenal, done by great men of God and women of God who really love the Word of God. So uh, my translation is more interpretive, and the reason why is because I'm trying to interpret for my people who follow my teaching. And so therefore, I explain my translation. In fact, if you want to know it in exhaustive detail, anybody who reads my PDF documents that'll be of the past uh, studies we've had, knows I go into great detail and I explain all my translations right down to the active voices and you know all the the, 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 the participle conjugations and all this, the, all of that, the, the syntax, the grammar and syntax of the passages that I teach, all in great detail of this particular letter will be up on our website in the not too distant future. I've already sent some documents over to our uh, to Titus Thompson who runs our Wenster.org site and designed that actually specific, specifically it's his design for how we do things here. So we saw that this book is written around sometime after 62 AD, after the uh, death of James, the Apostle James, and it was written by his brother Jude. And we see that uh, this is just prior to the war the Jews had with the Roman Empire, which, uh, between, which took place between 66 and 70 AD that was noted in great detail by Josephus, the uh, Jewish general who went over to the Romans and uh, he, it ended in the destruction of the, the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, and the city of Jerusalem, and it resulted in the people of uh, Judea being uh, deported throughout the Roman Empire into the city of Rome as well. And the Arch of Titus depicts those cap Jewish captives coming into Rome uh, at, at the hands of uh, at, at Titus, uh, whose father was the emperor Vespasian. And uh, he, uh, he brought them in as part of the, his, his triumphal procession. procession. And so uh, we see that um, the, this book was written to the Jewish Christian community in Judea. We also saw that, uh, uh, that the opponents that are described in this letter are uh, Jewish zealots. They're unsaved. The contents make clear that they are. And they're definitely Jewish. And we know that they're not false teachers because there's no uh, description of the nature of the teaching, nor is it explicitly said that they are false teachers. And also, when it talks about in some of the translations, as we pointed out, about uh, immorality or sexual immorality or sensuality as the ESV had, uh, that is uh, actually asa legea, which actually is speaking of criminal behavior. And uh, actually the word was used back in the ancient world to describe behavior that was criminal in the sense of rejecting the authority of Rome. So as we pointed out, the Jewish zealots, they were religious people. Uh, they were one of the four pillars of Jewish society in the first century. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, we can see that from the gospel. And then we have the Essenes down in the Dead Sea area. And then you had the Jewish zealots who uh, originated with Judas, the, um, the uh, Galilean. And uh, so uh, they believed in the sole rule of God. And, uh, and also uh, they were very stridently um, um, loyal to the Mosaic law. Uh, they believed that uh, they had to remove the Romans 
the Gentiles from Judea in order to prompt the Messiah to come back and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. This flies in the face of Christian teaching. That's why Paul, excuse me, Jude, says to contend to the, for the faith to the, the Christian community in Judea when he writes this letter. And the reason why, because they rejected the doctrine of the second advent of Jesus Christ, which contends that Jesus himself will personally and violently uh, establish the kingdom of God on earth at his second advent, which closes the 70th week of Daniel and the time, simultaneously the times of the Gentiles. So we see that the, this was a big problem because they were trying to persuade uh, people in this Judea to join them in their revolt against Rome. And uh, they also were trying to seduce the Christian community. Uh, they went in, they were infiltrating the Christian meetings and the Christians didn't realize what their intentions were. And so uh, they, their intentions were to try to persuade them to join them in their revolt. So this letter is a, serves as a great warning to the Christian community in Judea not to fall for unjustified civil disobedience, not to fall for this rebellion by the Jewish zealots led by them because they're not justified biblically to do this. And we pointed out that the Jewish zealots, according to Josephus, they believed in the you know book of Daniel. They used it, and a lot of these messianic movements did. And they interpreted the beast of Daniel chapter 7, the fourth beast, as Rome correctly. But they failed to realize that it wouldn't be, the Messiah wouldn't come back to establish the kingdom of God during the, the days of the fourth beast, but according to the days of the final stage of the fourth beast, Rome, which is the final stage of the Roman Empire under Antichrist, who's depicted on that fourth beast as the little horn, and the ten horns represent the ten-nation European confederacy that he will lead during the 70th week of Daniel, which is yet future. It won't begin until after the rapture, as we pointed out in our study of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-12. through 12. It starts with the Antichrist making a treaty with Israel, and it ends with the second advent of Jesus Christ. And then he established, then his, establishes his millennial reign on the earth. At the time, Satan and the fallen angels are imprisoned. The tribulational armies are destroyed. Antichrist and the false prophet are uh, sent into eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. And so this is all yet future to the rapture, which is imminent. And the rapture, of course, is the resurrection of the church. So this is what we get going on in this passage. So as we uh, look at our notes on the board, I like to make these notes available to you so you can follow along if you'd like. And a lot of people find these helpful. And if you want the notes, just uh, email me and I can send them to you. We have a list of people who like to do it. I don't send them out unless you want them. If you don't want them, there's no problem. I don't really care. It's less work for me to do. But uh, we see that, uh, as we noted in our study of Jude 5, this verse marks a transition in the body of this letter. Specifically, it's marking a transition from the identification of the purpose of the epistle, which is found in Jude verses 3 and 4, to verses 5 through 7, which present three examples of a group of individuals that God judged in the Old Testament for uh, Old Testament for their rebellion against him. And this is very important. When he mentions Sodom and Gomorrah, and he mentions uh, these fallen angels of Genesis 6, and uh, the sons of God, and uh, he's not talking, about, he's, the emphasis is not sexual immorality with the angels or the, the Sodom and Gomorrah. And because in part of these examples is the Exodus generation. What's in the emphasis with the writer is that he's emphasizing these people rebelled against God. Now, they could manifest that through sexual immorality, like with the angels uh, possessing the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex with women and uh, to corrupt the human behavior of the human race so that God would judge it. Or the so citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, they've expressed their rebellion, as we'll see, not only through sexual immorality, but uh, unethical behavior, as, as we pointed out in our study of Genesis in the past. So the emphasis here is that uh, this uh, is the verses five through seven present three examples of a group of individuals that God judged in the Old Testament for their rebellion against him. So everything is about the rebellion. So um, as I said before, in the contents of Jude, we have more than enough evidence that these the opponents of Jude, that Jude condemns in this letter, are the Jewish zealots. First of all, we know, that, like the Jewish zealots, the description of these individuals in Jude they're unsaved. We also know that they're rebellious. So were the Jewish. So were these Jewish zealous. They were rebelling against the Roman Empire, and Roman God had or de decreed for the Roman Empire to have authority over the kingdom of Judah, at that time. That's according to the the, the prophecies of Daniel, Daniel chapters two and seven, and uh, so this is very important. So the first of these examples, as we pointed out, appears in Jude five, uh, which speaks of the Lord disciplining unrepentant apostate members of the Exodus generation who rebelled against him by not trusting him in him even after he delivered them from the bondage of slavery in the land of Egypt. They died the sin into death. They were all believers. We pointed that out in great detail 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 makes that clear. The book of Exodus makes that clear. They put the blood of the animal on the doorpost and lintel. That was an expression of their faith. Their firstborn didn't die because of that faith, and they were delivered. That was a, their, at the moment. That was their justification right there. And then after their justification, after their conversion, they slipped over and over into disobedience to God. Now, the second of these examples, as we've been pointing out, is found in Jude 6, and it's the fallen angels at the antediluvian period, the period between the fall of Adam and the flood of Noah, who rebelled against the Lord by possessing the bodies of men in order to have sex with unregenerate women, which resulted in the birth of the Nephilim. The Nephilim were men. They were human beings, not half men and half angels. And the resultant proliferation in the world of evil was the result of these individuals, the Nephilim. So the third example, as we'll see starting tomorrow, appears in Jude 7, and it is the Lord judging the unrepentant, unregenerate, unsaved citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah who rebelled against the Lord by their immoral, and as we'll see also, their unethical behavior. Now, the contents of Jude 6, as we pointed out, are closely related to the concept taught in Jude 5, which we noted, again, asserts that sometime after he delivered the Exodus generation out from the land of Egypt, the Lord Jesus Christ destroyed them as a result of their unrepentant unbelief, which manifested their rebellion against him. Jude 6 uh, asserts that the Lord Jesus Christ, as we pointed out, is keeping by means of eternal chains under the control of total supernatural darkness for the purpose of executing the judgment during the great white, or the great day, the great white throne judgment against those angels who entered into the state of not keeping their own sphere of activity, but rather, in fact, abandon their own place of habitation. So therefore, what is being taught in Jude 5 and 6 is that the Lord judges those who unrepentantly rebel against him. And therefore, this is the correspondence between these two verses. This is very important. Brings out the holiness of God. Uh, you know, people have a, and, and even in the Christian community, have a distorted view of God because it's not biblically based or they, they gravitate to the love of God. And yes, God is a God of love. And uh, a good thing because he's also a God of holiness and he doesn't tolerate sinners. Sinners, and uh, nobody gets in, there's no toleration of sin on God's part because every sin in human history was imputed, credited to his son Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago and his son as a result experienced the wrath of God in our place. He lived the life that we should have lived, perfect obedience to the law because God is holy, demands perfection. We don't have perfection. None are righteous, no, not one. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we, Jesus did what we should have done, and he suffered what we should have, should have suffered. So whoever believes in him, trusts in him as Savior, which means that you have to believe he's both God and man, and because he's the, the mediator between a holy God and sinners. And then he's also, you have to believe in his resurrection because his resurrection demonstrated that God had accepted his work on the cross as the payment for our sins. And so, uh, and so, therefore, when you believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, you're, uh, basically the Holy Spirit will appropriate at that time your justification, all that God the Son provided for you and I through His crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father, which delivered us from eternal condemnation, uh, enslavement to sin and Satan in His cosmic system, uh, personal sins, physical and spiritual death, and condemnation from the law. What a great salvation that we have. So uh, when, to, when you were, when for people who rebel against him, whether you're in the Christian community or outside the Christian community, so for instance, the non-Christian, you're rebelling against the Lord when you reject his son, Jesus Christ, the Savior. You are sin, where sin is by nature and practice in the human race. That's rebellion against God. He has to do something about it. So he did something at the cross. So he didn't compromise with anybody's sin. Uh, God hates injustice. He hates child mol molestation. He hates all the evil that's going on in this world and it's going to do something about it. In fact, he's going to wipe the slate clean to Christ's second advent and it'll be a, a perfect environment and all rebels will be removed from the earth. And so uh, you're either on God's side, you're either a saint or you're an ain't. You're either on God's side. If you're against, if you, you manifest the fact that you're against God by your, your uh, opposing his will. And so God wants to turn these our, us as rebels into people who will worship him. And why wouldn't you want to worship a God who is, who, though he was holy uh, and we were condemned before him and uh, to, for eternal condemnation, he so loved us that he sent his one and only son, think about that, his perfect only son to suffer his wrath in our place so that we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. 
So don't tell me God doesn't care. He does care. And so after our justification, if we don't walk in faith and obedience to God's word, practice the command to love one another with interacting with each, our brothers and sisters in Christ, when we don't love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, when we're disobedient to him repeatedly as a lifestyle, he will discipline us. Because he's a God who loves his children and discipline is a big part of loving your children. And there's, uh, there's a warning discipline, there's intensive discipline, and then there's the dying discipline that Paul mentions to us in 1 Corinthians 11, 29. And uh, this, we study the sin of death in 1 John 5, 16 and many other places as well. And if we are unrepentant about our disobedience as children of God, he will take us home at some point. And I've seen many people taken home, sadly, in the body of Christ over the years that uh, who are stubbornly refusing to uh, walk in line with the Father's will, they're rebels. And so uh, they, they praise God that they're going to live with God forever, but they're not going to get a full reward at the Bama seat, unfortunately, for their uh, spending their times as Christians as being uh, unrepentantly rebellious against their Heavenly Father. Now in Jude 6, Jude 6 is actually properly interpreted by comparing its contents with the contents of Genesis 6, 1 through 8, as well as uh, 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, as well as 1 Peter 1, uh, actually 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, there's a typo in my notes. So this is all indicated by the fact that each of these three passages discuss the actions of fallen angels in relation to the judgment of the worldwide flood during the days of Noah. And this period we noted is the antediluvian period. Secondly, there's a connection between Jude 6 and Genesis 6, 1 through 8, as well as a connection between Jude 6 and 2 Peter verses uh, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. That's indicated by the fact that the condemnation of the angels, described in Jude 6, is fitting in light of the actions of the sons of God in the Nephilim in Genesis 6, 1 through 8. Thirdly, like Second Peter, Jude 6 describes these angels as presently chained under the control of total supernatural darkness and kept incarcerated until the day that their sentence of experiencing eternal condemnation is execu executed the great white throne judgment. So therefore, as we pointed out, G Genesis 6, 1 through 8, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Jude 6 are all speaking about a rebellion of some of Satan's fallen angels during the antediluvian period. Altogether, these four passages give us the identity of these angels and when in history they rebelled against the Lord and their present place of incarceration as well as the execution of their sentence of eternal condemnation at the great white throne judgment. So this brings out a principle I've mentioned many times in the past. When we interpret the Bible in this ministry, we're an expository type ministry. We go through the various books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book. We go through the various doctrines of the Christian faith in between books. And when we interpret the Bible, we interpret the Bible from the original languages of scripture. And we, it's, and we pay attention to uh, its literary context. We believe in authorial intent. What did the who was what was the writer's intent, and how did the original audience ex understand the writer, the biblical writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? We also compare uh, study the Bible in its historical context. Uh, the Bible is written in history and about and has historical events mentioned in it. Uh, we also record it for us, and we also uh, study the Bible and compare Scripture with Scripture. We don't build a doctrine after one after one piece of one piece of scripture or one line of scripture. We compare scripture with scripture to interpret the Bible properly. Now, this, this, this study is a manifestation of that we do that. Now, as we noted, there is a connection between Jude 6, again, and Genesis 6, 1 through 8, because the condemnation of the angels described in, the, in Jude 6 is fitting again, as we mo mentioned earlier, in light of the actions of the sons of God and the Nephilim in the latter. So therefore, like Genesis 6, 1-8, Jude 6 is again describing the rebellious actions of these fallen angels. In fact, as we also noted in detail, Jude 6 interprets the contents of Genesis 6, 2, and specifically that part of the verse which says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of human beings were beautiful and they married any one of them they chose. Jude 6 describes the, that these actions of the sons of God as that of entering into the state of not keeping their own sphere of activity, but rather, in fact, they abandoned their own place of habitation, never to return. So this was an attempt by Satan and the fallen angels to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God, not by 
having half men and half angels walking around, corrupting the human race that way, but corrupting the character of the human race, uh, so that having ungodly character, so that God would be prompted to judge the human race. And Satan wanted God to judge the human race because he wanted, uh, he didn't want the Son of God, who he knew from the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, to become a human being, and then he knew he was cooked. He knew he was done. 1 John 3.8, he, st he destroyed the works of the devil, the Lord did, at his first advent. And so uh, we see that Satan uh, was trying to, we, we, these fallen angels of Genesis 6, 1 through 8, the Spanaha Elohim, the sons of God, that expression sons of God in the Old Testament is always used like in Job uh, for the fallen angels or the angels. And then sometimes in Genesis 6, it's used of the fallen angels and Job, it's used of the angels in general. And so these fallen angels uh, some of them went in there and uh, the, the demon possessed, they possessed the bodies of unregenerate men and they had sex with unregenerate women and they produced the Nephilim who were human beings, not half men, half angels. The text says that, they're men, human beings. So therefore they couldn't be half men and half angels. The text says that. The, uh, the, these fallen angels did not have the ability to procreate. Jesus makes that clear in Matthew 22 when arguing with the Th Th Sadducees who didn't believe in a resurrection. And so they also, again, they don't increase or decrease in number. We know that it's inferred from Luke 20, verse 36. So they're not, uh, they're not, uh, they didn't have the ability to have sex with women. So they demon, they possess the bodies of unregenerate people, demon possession, so that they, these men, and use their bodies to have sex with these women in order to corrupt the character of the human race so bad that God would judge it. And he did. But unfortunately, Satan's uh, uh, plan did not work because Noah and his family were saved. And thus the human race continued after the flood. Now, as we wrap up our study of Jude 6, it's very interesting what's going on here in this verse. The, in Jude 6, actually employs the verb tereo, which I pointed out in the past. The first time it appears, it's negated by the negative particle me in the, in the Greek. So if you look at the ESV, it says in verse 6, and the angels, it did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He, the Lord, is kept in eternal chains until the judgment of the great day. Um, you also see, let me see if this is what they did here. Yeah, they did. So here's, they say, did not stay. Let's look at the NIV. I think they, I don't know why they didn't do that, but see, they translate tereos, uh, to stay. Yet here in verse uh, 6, he says, they translated the other half as kept. And so, um, so the NIV, let's see if they keep it consistent, which is, brings out the, the wordplay that's going on. Yes, they do. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, okay, the word keep, there it is, tereo, and it's negated by the negative particle may. So then it says, but abandon their own proper dwelling. These, he is kept, tereo, same word, without the negative particle in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So the NIV did a great job, I think better than the ESV, because they're keeping the word play there in the passage. So the English reader can see that there's a play on words here. Uh, let me see the Net Bible. I think they do the same thing. Yeah, uh, did not keep, he is kept, okay? There it is, te rao. The first one is uh, negated by the negative particle may, the second time it does, it's not negated by the negative particle may. Why is the writer doing this? And this is the great thing. See, this is a perfect example. You could see there's a wordplay going on, depending on your translation, um, yourself. And so why is he doing this? Why is this wordplay? In fact, he uses this word quite a bit, just like the Apostle John did. For those who studied 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John with me, and you see this in the Gospel of John, tereo is a word that John uses quite a, a bit in his epistles as uh, we studied. and though, But Jude is using this word quite a bit as well, and he's using it twice in this verse for literary purposes. And I believe he's using this verb several times throughout the, the, the epistle for a reason. It's a literary, he's, he's trying to do something here. And uh, we'll talk about that a little later. But Jude, Jude people, uh, in, in Jude 6, we have the verb tereo, as I pointed out to you, is employed twice. The first time, as I also pointed out to you in your English Bibles, it appears uh, it, uh, the first time it appears, it, it is negated by the negative particle may. Now, Jude uses the word twice in this vo verse in order to, and I mentioned this just a few moments ago, he's using this twice in this verb, twice in this verse, in order to form a play on words. Why? In order to emphasize that the punishment of these fallen angels 
whose sin and current incarceration is described in Genesis 6, 1 to 8, and 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, and 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5 in June 6, fits the sin they committed against God. In other words, their punishment corresponds to this sin. That's why Jude's doing this. So if you look at this again in the board, let's look at the NIV, verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but I, I, I believe it's their, um, my translation is, um, as we pointed out, it, instead of positions of authority, it's, it should be sphere of activity. So let's look at my translation. Correspondingly, he is keeping, terao, by means of eternal chains under the control of total super doctrinal, supernatural darkness for the purpose of executing the judgment during the great day of those who enter the state of not keeping their own sphere of activity, terao, but it rather, in fact, abandon their own place of habitation. So it's catching the reader, the, 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 the listener who heard this letter read for the first time in the meetings of the Christian community in Judea. And when they re read it, it would catch your eye. And it's basically saying, okay, so the first time we see he was keeping in chains, they're incarcerated. Why? Because they didn't keep their own sphere of activity. So the word play is emphasizing, again, as you look at my notes on the board, it's, uh, it's emphasizing that the punishment of those fallen angels whose sin and current incarceration is described in Jude 6 and Genesis 6, 1 through 8 and 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20 and 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, their sin, their punishment fits the sin they committed against God. In other words, as we just pointed out, their punishment corresponds to this sin. Lex Telionis, remember those, we, those who studied Habakkuk with me in Exodus? Uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That means, that simply means if you really, we, those who studied Exodus with me, um, it means the punishment must fit the crime. So like, for instance, in certain uh, nations that are under ex Islamic law, I pointed this out in the past, and this was actually in the media, uh, like for instance, there was a boy, a little boy, and uh, they should, I've, I've seen the pictures of this, pretty bad, and uh, this little boy was stealing, they caught him stealing, he's probably hungry, I don't know, maybe he his parents, maybe he was an orphan, I don't know, but uh, they caught him stealing, and then, they basically ran over his hand with a truck. And some places they'll cut the kid's hands off. And they say, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know, that that is wrong. That's not what God meant. That, that See, that, it doesn't mean that at all. Because what he's saying, the punishment must fit the crime. So that's not fitting. The punishment of a kid who's probably orphaned and starving, uh, even if he wasn't orphaned and starving, a, a little kid, uh, is it doesn't, what he did, stealing food, does not warrant cutting his hand off or running, into, running his hand over a truck. That's just common sense, right? But this is where not all Islamic people are like this. This is a, is a very, um, what do you call it, a zealous faction in Islam that does that. Just like a lot of people think Christians are all the same way. No, there's some crazy Christians out there. Every religion's got them. Muslims got them, and so do the Christians. They become crazy people. And it's all because they don't, as far as the Christians are concerned, because they misinterpret the Bible. And this is one of the ways they do that. So uh, it's punishment must fit the crime. So, you know, like for instance, when God instituted capital punishment, Genesis 9 we studied, after the flood. And, you know, uh, if you shed, uh, you, uh, if you uh, kill somebody, uh, you murder somebody in cold blood, okay, you, you must, the punishment must fit the crime, which is you must be executed. Your, must, your life must be taken. And uh, that's, God, that's the punishment fits the crime. So when Jude uses this wordplay in Jude 6, he's saying that the angel's punishment, it fits what the it fits the uh, this it corresponds to this sin. It fits it's the appro appropriate pr uh, punishment for what they did. Now Richard Barkham speaks on this. He's a great scholar, and uh, great scholar. And uh, when I I, you know, I say this from time to time about scholars, when I quote somebody, um, it doesn't mean I agree with every single thing the person says. You know. It, it, you know, I mention this because some people, when I when I say certain things about you know people, I'm not saying I don't think these guys are any good. If I say I don't agree with everybody, you know who does? And nobody agrees with me. That's obvious, right? I'm sure that's, there's a lot of you don't agree with me. But what I'm saying is like you know, I, I, just because I quote a guy, I quote the guy because what he says is good. Now, is there like Richard Bockham? Now he do, he doesn't he, he's not a dispensationalist. I am. But do I, do I throw block him out of there and not learn from him uh, because that? No, you know? Uh, so 
Uh, so there are people I like for different, you know, I like that are very good. They might not be a dispensationalist. They not, they, you know, but they, they adhere to the, the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith, justification by faith, confession of sin, you know, they're, they're, and they're good, good interpreters. And, uh, but, you know, there's not, you're not going to agree with everybody on everything. You know, I, I, would ex- I would expect people would not agree with me on everything I interpret and I teach. And I, I get that. And I, that's part of the thing, you know, so... And as I always say, you know, okay, well, what's your interpretation? Let me hear what your interpretation is. And uh, so that's why, you, you know, uh, I, I don't mind it, people disagreeing with me. And, I mean, that's part, of the, that's part of the job, you know. But, um, but you know, so uh, when I quote people, again, I, 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 like Bach, he has something very good to say. So I will, you know, I will, um, I will use him to, to help us out. And he'll help me actually uh, interpret uh, explain this passage for you. Sometimes when I quote people, they can say it better than I can say. That's why I quote them. So, oh, they have something I've never heard before that I think is very good to share with you. So Richard Barkham, who's an excellent, again, an excellent top-notch scholar, he writes the following. He says, one reason for Jude's use of Tere, which is the infinitive form of Tereo. He says, one reason for Jude's use of Tere to keep here is to, in Jude 6 is to make a grim play on words with me Tere Santes, Saint Terre Santas, which is actually uh, the participle form of this particular word, which is translated did not keep with the negative particle may. So we, he says one reason for Jude's use of Terre to keep here is to make a grim play on words with may Terre Santas, did not, who did not keep in the first part of the verse. Since the angels have not kept their position, the Lord now keeps them chained. This is an example of the common practice of describing a sin in its judgment in corresponding terms so that the punishment fits the crime. Lex Telionis, as I mentioned to you before, we talked about this principle in the Bible in Exodus. Those who studied Exodus with me, it's all over that book and also Habakkuk. And then he goes on to say, Bachman goes on to say, the, the, um, uh, he says that the, uh, this is an example of the common practice of describing a sin in its judgment in corresponding terms so that the punishment fits the crime. Lex Telionis, Terrain, to keep, seems to be one of Jude's catchwords. He uses it in verses 1, 13, and 21, as I pointed out in the past. The angels contrast with faithful Christians, he says, who should keep their position in God's love, verse 21, and whom God keeps safe, not for judgment, but for salvation at the last day, verse 1. Such plays on the word are not unlikely, since terrain, a common word in early Christian, especially Johannine vocabulary, as I also pointed out to you, is similarly played on elsewhere, like John 17, 6, he says in verses 11 and 12 of that chapter and Revelation 3, 10, end of quote. So Jude 6, now here's the implications, very important, and it leads to our application for us in the Christian community. Jude 6 would be a firm reminder to the Christian community in Judea that their rebellious, unregenerate countrymen who called themselves zealots and were rebelling against the authority of the Roman Empire over Judea would receive the same fate as the rebellious angels in the days of Noah. Thus, they better not get on involved in unjustified civil disobedience. As I pointed out many times, those who studied Daniel with me, like in Daniel 6 and Daniel 3, those chapters with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, being, uh, practicing justified civil disobedience. There are instances in the Bible where we are justified to disobey the civil authorities. In this country, we don't have that going on right now. There's no situation that I know that uh, would warrant us being justified as Christians and rebelling against the civil authorities here in America. So, uh, for instance, uh, the, the Hebrew midwives in Exodus, uh, Pharaoh issued a decree to kill the Jewish baby boys once they're born. That they wouldn't do it. They actually lied. And this is a perfect example. They were justified in lying to protect those children. And God blessed them, it says. And then we also see that was, that was justified civil disobedience. Why? Because murdering young, innocent children is, is against the will of God. Uh, then we have Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar put up an image of himself, really, in the plain of Dura there in Babylon. And he required everybody in his kingdom to worship that image. That's idolatry. They disobeyed. They suffered the consequences, but the Lord delivered them. And Nebuchadnezzar was saved, actually, because of that. Those who studied Daniel with me. And so that's justified civil disobedience. Daniel, uh, the, the, the Persian ruler uh, at that time, was uh, hoodwinked. He was deceived into issuing a decree 
uh, for the, the Medo Persians, once you issued this decree, you couldn't rescind it, and not even he could. And uh, because Daniel's contemporaries in, in the government wanted to have uh, have rub him out, get rid of him, because they were jealous of him, and so they persuaded uh, the, the Persian ruler to issue a decree that anybody who prays to their god or doesn't pray to uh, to to the the Persian ruler uh, would be executed. He can't pray to their god, only to him. Well, Daniel said, I'm going to pray to my God. He did three times each day, in the morning, in the middle of the day, and in the afternoon. And he was executed. But the Lord delivered him. And then we have Peter, James, and John. They were told by the Jewish Sanhedrin, which is Gen uh, Acts 5, that they could not pre preach the gospel. And they said, well, we're going to obey God, not you. And they were right. That's justified civil disobedience. Now, please tell me, in America, where do we have something like that going on? I don't know of anything. And yet we have Christians, and it's always politically politically driven. The Bible comes first, not what not what the conservative doctrine is, or what the conservatives are saying, or the liberals are saying, or the libertarians are saying, all right, or the independents are saying. What is, we make our decisions in life and live our lives according to what God's word says. So, uh, not what Fox says, not what CNN has to say. Too many Christians are watching so much television, they need to shut it off and spend more time in their Bible than watching television. And if I, if I just upset you, you know what? Good. That means you're guilty. The Holy Spirit's convicting you. What are you going to do about it? You're going to still be the same person who's becoming cosmic, watching the, the, the news broadcasts or, which are slanted. They don't even report the news anymore. Nobody does. They interpret it for you. And there's a big war of, of words and ideologies going on. They're not even reporting it anymore. They're entertainers interpreting for their th whatever think tank, that, think tank that they belong to. Wake up and smell the coffee what's going on in the country. So to protect ourselves from the lies that are going on out there, and there are lies on both sides of the aisle in our government. And because everybody's looking out for their own interests. It's very rare you see somebody who's looking out for the interests of their country and uh, was able to go against what the uh, the party line in their party is. And that's very, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And there have been some leaders that we had in the past that did that at their own peril. And some even died for, for doing the right thing, though it, would, it, it, it was not popular in their own government. That's happened throughout history. So... We don't, we, we, what Jude is six is warning the Christian community of Judea, do not join these Jewish zealots who are rebelling against the Roman authorities. And uh, because one, you don't join them because they're practicing unjustified civil, di civil disobedience. Two, Jesus taught he's bringing in the kingdom. They don't need, Jesus doesn't need their help. In fact, they don't even believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the Jewish zealots. So there's, we have to understand these things. So the reader... Uh, must remember that this authority of the Roman government over Judea was ordained by God as revealed in the prophecies of Daniel, which we studied in great detail, which was ordained by God according to the contents of Daniel 2, 7, 9, 24 through 27, and Daniel uh, uh, chapter 11. So these passages all describe the times of the Gentiles when the Jews, the times of the Gentiles, Jesus mentions this in his Olivet, uh, not in his Olivet Discourse, but when he came into Jerusalem to present himself to the, as the Jewish Messiah. But he knew, and he wept over the city of Jerusalem, knowing, you're going to reject me until the times of the Gentiles are ended, and that will end at the second advent, that period. So these passages that I mentioned in Daniel all describe the times of the Gentiles when the Jews would be subject to the Gentile powers in contrast to the millennial reign of Christ when the situation will be reversed. Furthermore, Romans 13, 1-7, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, reminded the Christian community in Rome that they must submit to the Roman civil authorities which were ordained by God. Romans 13, 1-7, and the Nevin Bible goes as follows. Let every person, Paul says, be subject to the governing authorities. And who was on the throne but that guy that would end up killing him, executing him? Nero. We don't have anybody close to Nero in our, in our history in America. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment. And the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. The implication is they're also accountable to him. Nobody's getting away with anything. No ruler that we have ever had, leader, or the history of the world has ever got away with anything. Trust me. That, you know, I say trust me because God says trust me. Okay, They're, they're accountable to him. So the person who resists such authority resist the ordinance of God and those who resist will incur judgment for rulers 
cause no fear for good conduct, but for bad conduct, criminal behavior. Do you not? Do you desire not to fear authority? Do good, and you will receive its condemnation. Commendation, excuse me, not condemnation. Verse four: For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be in fear, for it does not bear the sword in vain. It is God's servant to administer retribution to the wrongdoer, the, the, the criminal activity, the criminal. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath of the authorities, but also because of your conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes for the authorities, are God's servants devoted to governing. Pay everyone what is owed, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. Remember Jesus said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar, and to God which is God. And so, we also, Peter says something similar. Apostle Peter did the same thing as Paul when teaching the Jewish Christian community throughout the Roman Empire in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14. It goes as follows. Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, Peter says, whether to a king as supreme or to governors as those who he commissions to punish wrongdoers and praise those who do good. For God wants you to silence the ignorance of foolish people by, being, by doing good. So not being um, a criminal. So, as we wrap up our study of Jude 6, this verse is phenomenal. We see that the, the, he's describing, interpreting the actions of the fallen angels of Genesis 6, the sons of God, and they, impregnate, they, uh, in, uh, they possess the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex with unregenerate women. They, as a result, they uh, produced the Nephilim. They were human beings, the text says. And so these individuals corrupted the character of the human race, so much so that God judged it. That's what Satan wanted, because he didn't want the incarnation of the Son of God to take place. He knew that would, because of what God said in, in the Garden of Eden after the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15. Yeah, the Messiah, her seed, the woman's seed, would crush the head of Satan, and he would bruise the, uh, the Lord's heel. So he knew that. So therefore, he was trying to prevent the incarnation by corrupting the, the character of the human race, causing God to judge it. And he did, but he didn't get Noah. Noah and his family survived because they trusted in the Lord. And so, uh, God, Paul, the Apostle, uh, excuse me, uh, the Holy Spirit, through the, uh, this epistle, through Jude, who's the writer, uh, Jude, he was warning the Christian community in Judea not to follow after the Jewish zealots, and he gives these fallen angels as an example of God judging people, uh, judging individuals who rebel against them. And in fact, these individuals are angels. We have the first example in verse 5. He judged the Exodus generation who were believers in apostasy, which there would be a big heads up for the Christian community in Judea because they were believers. So it was a, that was a warning not to go in an apostasy by following after these Jewish zealots who believed that they had to rebel against Rome, the Gentiles, and then the Messiah would come back. But the Bible says no. Jesus and the apostles in the Old Testament taught that Jesus himself will bring in the kingdom himself. And so these Jewish zealots were contrary, acting contrary to that. And so that's why Jude says to contend for the faith. That particular, that part of the faith, the Christian doctrine, which is talking about the second advent of Christ. So this was a warning. Verse 6 was a warning uh, not to rebel against the, uh, uh, against the Jewish, uh, the, the Roman civil authorities. Don't follow the, Jew, the Jewish zealots in this rebellion because God judges rebellious people, re people who rebel against his a delegated authority. And the governmental officials that we have, federal, state, local government, and around the world, have been delegated authority by the Lord. Everybody's going to give an account to him that's a leader and has been a leader and will be a leader and is a leader now. You all have to give an account. So be God rules the world. So, and everybody's, no one's getting away with anything. So we need this Christian community to, to, to listen to what Jude's saying and obey the civil authorities we, unless we have justified means or justified civil disobedience, we have some uh, biblical justification for our di civil disobedience, and we don't have that right now here in America as far as I can say. So we see that uh, this is a great warning and a great application for the Christian community, and I said this before, we're coming up to another election, and there's been talk in the media, even among mil generals that I've read, that warning the country if there's another problem with a, an election, like the last one, uh, there are a lot of admirals, military people, generals, people who are serious people who love their country, who didn't think that last election was on the up and up. And, they, and this general's warning, he's afraid that a coup might happen, a military coup in this country. That would be a devastating, terrible thing to happen in this country, for that to happen. 
So if you're a military person, you're a Christian, please listen to this message and spread that message out there about uh, we have to have justified civil disobedience uh, before we, you know, we, before we rebel against the civil authorities, we don't want to do that. In fact, what he should be doing as a Christian, First Peter, First, First Timothy two, as we studied in the past, that book, First Timothy two one through five says we're to pray for our leaders so we can have a tranquil and quiet life. So if, if the other, if the other, the leader is a, some, an opposing party and you don't like their policies, great thing in this country, you can vote them out in the next election. Okay, you can vote them out. God bless America, we have that. Great, we can vote them out. And uh, so we need to keep that in mind. But also, we want to pray for these people. Yeah, they might have your a, a view that you don't like, and they might be a socialist, you don't like socialists, or whatever it is that you don't like, they're a communist. Pray for them, more than reason to play, pray for these people. Especially with communism and socialism, is godless, that's, that's quite clear. So we need to keep these things in mind, people. And, and, and we are in exciting times in America, exciting times. And uh, the God's word, uh, can help us get through these tumultuous and, and exciting times and terrifying times in, in, in some respects with the talk of uh, nuclear war between the superpowers is out there in the media. Very, very dangerous time that we're living in. So uh, pray for your leaders, the military, political and, uh, leaders, civil government, civil authorities, uh, national, uh, state, local level, pray for your leaders. And because uh, and, and they need the prayers and uh, and we need to get the word of God out and, and, and hear it, a sound doctrine, because that's how we're going to bring glory to God in the angelic conflict between God and Satan. So remember tomorrow, uh, we are, we're going to have our class, for, it's usually scheduled for Sunday, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, because I'm going down to Huntsville, Alabama, to see my friends down there at Doctrinal Bible Church, the Pastor Eddie uh, Buddy Peak. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study a word. We pray that this lesson be a great blessing to you people, bringing glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ, ministering to you people and any unsaved. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ,